Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So yesterday I uh, uh, introduced this introduces this business, uh, uh, this idea of GROM of, of uh, uh, studying Riemannian manifolds through their weak limits, in some sense. And uh, introduce the notion of CD K infinity metric measure space uh, uh, as uh, uh, given by dot Schulman Villani. I mean, Schulman on one side and dot Villani on the other, independently at the same time. And then uh, uh, discuss the issue of uh, the presence of Fisler structures. Uh, uh, inside this class, I mean the issue, de facto, huh? that, uh, whether this is an issue or not. I mean, uh, uh, each one chooses its own answer, but for sure, if one wants geometric rigidity properties to hold uh, uh, on metric measure spaces, I mean those physical structures should be uh, ruled out. And I and I uh, uh, told you what was the plan in order to 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 to, to do this, and, and the idea was. Uh, 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 to study, I mean, to uh, to look at spaces where uh, the space of so metric measure spaces, such that the space of Sobole functions was Hilbert, yeah. and uh, and the hard uh, task in in uh, attempting such a definition is to prove that C D K infinity plus W one two is Hilbert uh, is to prove that this notion is stable with respect to this measure of Waldorf congruence. Now, a first step in this direction was done yesterday by showing that the, uh, uh, the gradient flow of the relative entropy with respect to the Wasserstein distance uh, 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 that exists is unique and is a stable notion, per se. So, so, so that the class of metric measure spaces, CD can finish, such that the, uh, um, the gradient flow of the relative entropy linearly depends on the initial measure, that is already a, a, I mean a stable class. Now, such gradient flow, we know after Jordan, Kinder, and Otto that uh, uh, when our space is smooth, it's the heat flow. Huh? And now, so, so the idea now is to link such gradient flow to the gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy in a metric measure space, so that linearity of the gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy will then be linked to the uh, uh, Hilbert property of the space W12. So today, I will start presenting the other side of the story. So. Uh, 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 we start introducing what it is the Dirichlet energy or the analogous of Dirichlet energy in a metric measure space, and then we, we I mean, the story will continue. Um, so uh, uh, now Dirichlet energy is very much linked to well, I, I mean, if you know who is the Dirichlet energy, essentially you also know who is the Sobolev space, and vice versa, the Sobolev space that W12. I mean, the Dirichlet energy should be one half integral of Gradev squared. Um, uh, of course, when we are on RD or on an Maya manifold, we don't really have any doubts on what the, this energy should be. I mean, you take the distributional notion of uh, differential or gradient, and then you integrate the square uh, with respect to your given volume measure, and you're done. On a metric measure setting, uh, we, we do not really have, uh, at least for now, we do not really have uh, a notion of uh, distributional differential or distributional gradient, and so we might be in trouble in I mean, uh, 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 defining the Dirichlet energy. But in fact, we are not, uh, and uh, it is it is well known uh, since at least I would say 15 years uh, how to define Sobolev functions. I mean, real valued Sobolev functions on a metric measure space, and the basic uh, 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 the basic idea is that if you want to define, say, a function in W12, you don't really have uh, uh, to to uh, uh, know who is the distributional gradient or distributional differential of that function. It is sufficient to know who is its modulus. Because then if you ask that modulus to be in L2, I mean, then you're done. Uh, 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 and this might be an easier task, right, to do, I mean, modulus of something may be easier to, to define than something itself, especially in a non-smooth structure like, like that of metric measure space. And, 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 and this is what can be done, and I will do, and I will present a possible construction, a possible definition of sobre space. Um, it's not the only one, it's not the first one, it's just one which will be, I mean, uh, helpful, I mean, uh, for, for our uh, later discussions. The first works in this direction goes back to Koska and McManus. There has been incredible advances thanks to uh, Cheeger and also Sean Galligam and others. But the definition that I'm going to go, uh, gonna give is due to myself, Ambrosio and Savare, but it's equivalent to, to previous one. Uh, uh, so let me start with an observation. 
uh, uh, the observation is that uh, you can define the modulus of the differential of a smooth function on RD space without ever taking a derivative uh, by just a variation of principle. And the observation is what is written on the slide. So the modulus of the differential of f uh, is the least continuous. So f is a smooth function. Then the modulus of the differential uh, is the minimum continuous function, g, for which this inequality holds for every smooth function. It is trivial that modulus of the differential works there. And it's also quite easy to see that if a function g is smaller, strictly smaller than the modulus of the differential in a point, then by continuity it should be smaller than a neighborhood. And then if you pick a gradient flow of f, I mean, you follow the gradient line of f, you would uh, falsify this inequality. Okay. Uh, uh, well, then the idea is, uh, 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 OK, uh, this notion per se cannot really work uh, for uh, stable functions. I mean, it is too point-wise, in a sense. Huh? I mean, for the stable function, the left-hand side doesn't even make sense for every point. I mean, the, the notion should be invariant un under uh, ch uh, I mean changing the, your function in a negligible set. Uh, uh, so, so what do we do? Well, we do what we always do when we work with stable functions. So we pass or uh, we pass from a formulation embedded in a continuous framework to a, in a weak to a formulation in a, in a weak one, which is we pass to a pointwise uh, 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 inequality to an integrated inequality. So, so here the idea is to integrate at the level of curves huh? uh, with respect to appropriate measures on, on, on the space of curves. Uh, uh, so what do we do is the following, and I will, I will directly uh, uh, switch to the metric measure setting, and I define the notion of test plan. So a test plan is a probability measure on the space of continuous curves. Huh? So C01x is the space of continuous curves from 0, 01 to x which is endowed with the uh, uh, tube distance, so it is complete and separable, and I can take probability measures on, on it. And I say that it is a test plan if two conditions are satisfied. Uh, 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 so the first concerns uh, the time marginal. Uh, uh, so let me introduce a, a notation which I will frequently use in my talks. Uh, uh, so C01x is our space of continuous curves, and for every t, <laughs> In 0, 1, I will consider the evaluation map, ET, from this space to x, which is the map which takes a curve gamma and gives back gamma time t, evaluate the, 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 the curve time t. Now, if I have a probability measure over here, ET put forward, that measure will be a probability measure over here. Okay? And, and uh, uh, the first requirement uh, for, for my probability measure on the space of curves to be a test plan is that ET push forward such measure should be bounded from above by some constant times my reference measure. Huh? So uh, XDM is a given metric measure space, and, and this is the first condition. And I, I should think to this condition as a condition that requires uh, pi to be concentrated on, on curves which do not overlap too much. I want those curves to be to be spread out. And the second condition is a condition. We, so the first condition speaks with the measure of my metric measure space, and the second condition speaks with the distance of my metric measure space. And this is a condition about the regularity. Now, if you don't know, so so this is the so the total kinetic energy, in a sense, uh, uh, of curves weighted by pi should be finite. Now, if you don't know what it is, the metric speed replace this condition by pi is concentrated on equilibrium curve. It's not really uh, technically speaking the correct thing to do, but it's close enough. Huh? It gives you the idea. Huh? So you want the, the curves uh, on which pi is concentrated to, to, be, to, be, to be quite smooth. Now, if we have this notion of test plan, we can give the definition of Sobolev like function by requiring, well, by saying the following. So I said the function is Sobolev. Huh? We belong to the class S2. Huh? If there exists an L2 function g, non negative, such that the same inequality that we wrote before holds uh, with the only difference that it is not written anymore for each curve gamma, but integrated uh, with respect to pi for each test, test plan pi. So it's the very same inequality that we were before. Okay. Now, now uh, uh, why this definition makes sense of Sobolev functions? Because if theorem pick this definition on the Euclidean setting, well, then a function will be Sobolev in this sense if and only if it has a distributional differential in a tree. If and only. Okay, so as usual, we pick a theorem and turn it into a definition, right? I mean, in the metric measure setting, the standard definition of Sobolev functions based on integration by parts uh, is not there, uh, but 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 we can certainly make this. Now it turns out 
this is not really easy to prove, but it turns out that uh, uh, if a function is Sobolev in this sense, then, then uh, there exists a minimal a function g, minimal really in the almost everywhere sense. And I will denote it by modulus of the f. Hmm? Now, thi this guy th is typically called uh, in, the, in the literature minimal weak upper gradient. And I will stick to that uh, terminology, although it is a bit misleading because this guy, as you can see from the definition, it acts in duality with the speed of curves. Now, the speed of a curve is something which is tangent. So something which acts in duality with speed of curves should be cotangent. Eh? So it should maybe uh, probably a weak upper differential rather than a weak upper gradient. But anyway, I mean, th that's why, that's why I, will, I will denote this by modulus of the f. Eh? Although there is no the f for the moment. Okay. Huh? But, but uh, th th let's just keep in mind this. Um, OK, so, so, so some properties. So wh wh why, why should we think that as a modulus of the differential? Well, here are some properties of, of, of some calculus rules, basic calculus rules. Uh, first of all, it is lower semi-continuous. That, that's sort of what we gain uh, by uh, writing, uh, um, I mean, asking the, the definition integrated with respect to test plans pi, rather than uh, uh, looking for the validity of that uh, weak upper gradient inequality along every curve. Eh? That what we gain is the lower semi-continuity. So if you have a sequence of functions converging almost everywhere, uh, whose minimal weak upper gradients also converge, say weakly in a two to some function g, well then your limit function f is Sobolev, and that g bounds from above the, the, the minimal weak upper gradient. Uh, so that's a sort of lower semi-continuity of minimal weak upper gradient. Then we have a, a, a locality property in a quite strong sense. So, so if, uh, 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 so, uh, if two fu Sobolev functions agree on a certain Borel set, then in, then in the same Borel set the minimal weak upper gradients also agree almost everywhere. So that would be sort of easy if the Borel set were open. Huh? But th I mean, that's really, that's really Borel. And then we have a chain rule and a Leibniz rule in the, in the sort of best possible sense. OK? And, uh, and uh, well, now, now I have this sub function. I have this minimal weak upper gradient. And then I have my analogous of dirichlet energy. Huh? So I can take the function defined on L2, huh? which, which, I mean, if a function is back, if a function is sub it is one half the integral of, of minimal weak upper gradient squared and plus infinity otherwise. Huh? And let me perhaps make a link with, with, uh, with something which was uh, uh, sort of hinted yesterday. Uh, I, I could possibly give a completely different characterization of, of this uh, uh, sort of Dirichlet energy over here, which is the following. I mean, uh, let me remind that if f is Lipschitz, well, the lip local Lipschitz constant of f, of a function f, that is, the, as was defined yesterday by, by Honda, that is the lim sup of when y goes to x of uh, the modulus of the incremental ratio. OK? I mean, uh, you take this by definition as 0 if x is isolated, and otherwise you, you take this lim sup. And now what is true is that uh, the energy of a function, and uh, this is absolutely non-trivial, but the energy of a function is equal to the infimum of the lim inf uh, of one half integral of local Lipschitz constant squared, the m, where the inf is taken uh, among, among all sequences uh, converging L2 to f of Lipschitz function. OK, so, so in L2. Yes. Uh, well, we could play as much as we want. I mean, uh, L in every LP, that, that, would, that would really work the same. I mean, it, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, not at infinity, because uh, that, that would be too much, but uh, every, every LP works the same. Okay? But here, I'm defining my, my Dirichlet energy in L2. So, so that's what, what, what I'm taking. So, so, so the Dirichlet energy is, much like in RD, uh, the lower semi-continuous relaxation of the function which takes Lipschitz function and gives back the integral of local Lipschitz constant squared. So, 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 so then the question, so, uh, I mean, this is not trivial. Huh? But anyway, uh, if you take this approach, then you can, then you can see that uh, considering, uh, I mean, there might be spaces where if you have a Lipschitz function, then uh, the Dirichlet energy of the Lipschitz function coincides with the integral of its local Lipschitz constant squared, and some spaces which are not. Um, but this is more a property of, of, of the space. And if the space has doubling and Poincare, this is the case. 
uh, for those of you who, who know what it means, in general can be null. Uh, so, so the fact that here there is a lower semi-continuous relaxation is what ensures that the sublet space is a space of function. Uh, that's, that's Every, every. So this is true for every space. That the, the, that function, that function I defined over there is the same as this. Complete separable. Uh, and M a radon measure non negative. Uh, that, that, that's the start. Of but that, that you can also see the lower semiconductivity is totally fine, but also, also for here. Uh, uh, and also, I mean, also, or if you want direct, directly from the definition, because if, if you put, if you have Fn and Gn, uh, and Gn is weakly really converging, then the right-hand side will converge uh, to, to the limit and the left-hand side also. So, so, and that's the advantage of using set plans. Uh, okay, so the lower semi-continuity is also evident, evident, evident from, 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 from this approach. What, what this shows is, uh, is uh, perhaps uh, 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 a link with uh, one of the links of this sublet function with the metric, uh, because ellipse is constant is a very metric uh, 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 object. And then you know that when you relax the interior of this metric object, you obtain exactly this, this sublet space. OK? Yeah, so, so this Dirichlet energy uh, is convex and lower semi-continuous. Huh? I'm calling here Dirichlet energy, and probably I will stick to, to this, to this, to this uh, annotation. Though in some papers, especially in some papers of mine, this is called uh, Chigar energy to emphasize that this function is not necessarily a quadratic form. Huh? Nothing ensures that there is a bilinear form, so EFG says that EFF is our energy. Huh? Uh, uh, that's because in particular, if we are on a normed space, on a Fisler setting, uh, then we have this issue with the norm that, that we have already discussed here. Okay? So, so this is not really quadratic. Now, if I want, so now the space of sublet function S2 that I previously defined, and uh, I mean, spoke just with the differential. Uh, there, were, there was uh, no integrability assumption at the level of, 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 of f. But if I, import, if I take the functions, which are both in S2 and in L2, then I'm, I, I'm very entitled to, to call this space W12. Huh? And the norm which I put on W12 will be, will be, will be the L2 norm of f squared plus the L2 norm of the minimal weak upper gradient. And then I take the square. OK? So, so, so. And W12 is always a Banach space. Uh, will not always be an Hilbert space. <laughs> the, so it is easy to check that W12 is, is uh, 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 normed. I mean, that this is a norm. The fact that it is complete is tightly related to the lower semi-continuity of it. And that's more or less the same. Huh? OK. Um, then uh, uh, we have the sublet space. We have the Dirichlet energy. And now we have a Laplacian. Well, a first definition of a Laplacian. We will see others uh, uh, later on. Uh, so how can we define a Laplacian? Well, uh, 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 well, let me give you a definition. Uh, uh, I say that, so convex functions, convex lower semi-continuous functions on, on, on Hilbert spaces, they, they have some differentials, right? I mean, uh, uh, th th that makes sense. So I take my convex function, which is the Dirichlet energy, on my Hilbert space L2. And then I say, look, if I have a function f uh, who, such that the subdifferential of my energy at f is non empty, well, then I say that this function has a Laplacian. And I would like to take the Laplacian as the element of the subdifferential. I might be not sure that, that there is only one element, so I have to pick one. And then, then, then I, take, I define the Laplacian of f as the opposite of the element of minimum norm in the subdifferential. Now, if you take your standard Dirichlet energy, on Rd, or on Riemannian manifold, then the, the space of functions with Laplacian in L2 coincides with the space of functions with non-empty subdifferential. Huh? And whenever the subdifferential is non-empty, it has a unique element, and that element is minus the, the Laplacian. Okay? And so I take the same definition. I might be in trouble with uniqueness uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the subdifferential. Well, I pick one, I pick the guy with me. And uh, uh, why this it can be a, a, a sort of uh, a reasonable notion of, sub of, of Laplacian? Well, at least uh, uh, some basic integration by parts is there. So for instance, I, I take a function which has a Laplacian and a sublet function, uh, and I integrate g Laplacian of f. Well, then it models this is bounded from above by the integral of modulus of differential of f, modulus of differential of g. Huh? And this is a one-line proof. Huh? 
No? By the way, how, how do you, let me, let me convince you that this is true. Uh, um, uh, uh, so, so, so what do I know by, by uh, the fact that the La minus the Laplacian is, is indeed subdifferential? Well, I know that the energy of F plus the integral of, of well, minus the Laplacian of F times, uh, uh, let me write here, epsilon g. Huh? This is less or equal than the energy of F plus epsilon g, right? That's, that's the subdifferential proof, right? So, so I take this on, on the left hand side, on the right hand side. And then, and then, and, and, and then I write what, what it is. I mean, uh, well, actually, so this is equal to one half integral of minimal weak upper gradient of f plus epsilon g squared, right? But the minimal weak upper gradient, I mean, is, is, is sub additive, so this is less or equal than the minimal weak upper gradient of f plus epsilon minimal weak upper gradient of g squared, right? And, and then I should subtract uh, the, the uh, minimal weak upper gradient of f. And now when you expand, uh, the, the part with df squared uh, will disappear. Uh, and you remain with, uh, with uh, epsilon, say, in integral of df dg, hmm? plus something uh, of second order. And that's it. I mean, now you let epsilon go to 0, and, uh, and you are done. OK? So, 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 so it's really a one-line consequence of the definition of Laplace. And, and with a similar trick, you prove that if perhaps g is of the form a function of f, then you have equality, and then, as you see there. So some basic property of the Laplacian idea. The Laplacian is linear? Well, no. Uh, it is linear if and only if w12 is Hilbert. If and only if. OK? And now we have a convex lower semi-continuous uh, uh, functional over, over uh, uh, 2. With actually with dense domain, this can be seen by 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 by, by this uh, by, by this property. So every function in L two can be approximated in L two by Lipschitz functions, and uh, Lipschitz functions uh, have finite Dirichlet energy because the energy is bounded by from above by the square of the Lipschitz constant. So we know that for every function in L two, there exists a unique gradient flow of of of, uh, uh, of the function. Okay, and uh, I can also call this heat flow. Uh, uh, notice that typically in the gradient flow equation for, uh, I mean, uh, in Hilbert space, you see time derivative belongs to minus the subdifferential of the function. So it is a differential inclusion. In fact, I mean, it's not, this is not really important, but in fact, uh, whenever you have a gradient flow or, or, or in a Hilbert space, not only the time derivative belongs uh, to the minus the subdifferential, but always picks minus the element of minimal norm. Huh? So that's why, that's why, I mean, we get really the heat equation on, on metric measure settings. This is not crucial, but it's just, I mean, I mean you, you can see that we have a sort of PD eh, in our metric measure system. OK, so, 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 so we also, so we, we add yesterday the gradient flow of the relative entropy in, uh, with respect to Wasserstein. Now we have a Dirichlet energy and its gradient flow in L2. And, uh, and, uh, and now, now the, the theorem is the following. Now this is the relevant result. Uh, 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 if you have a, a CDK infinity space and you take a probability measure with finite second moment, which is absolutely continuous, and which has a density f, which is in L2. Now I can, I can consider, consider, say, two evolutions uh, for, for, for this. I can consider uh, either the evolution, the level of density, so I can consider the, 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 the curve ft with values in L2, which gives me the, the gradient flow of the, my Dirichlet energy in L2, starting from my initial value f, that is well defined. Or I can consider the evolution of uh, the gradient flow of the relative entropy with respect to, to the Wasserstein space. Okay? And the statement is that the two coincide, the two evolutions coincide. So at every time t greater or equal than 0, mu t is equal to f0. Huh? So, so these two a priori very different evolutions actually are the same. Uh, and this theorem has been proved by myself, Kowal and Dota, in the setting of Alexandro spaces, because it was, I mean, there were some analytic tools which were already present, and then generalized uh, to CDK infinity one, uh, together with Ambrose and Savare. By the way, sort of where our, the work with Ambrose and Savare was more uh, about building, I mean, 
building the tools in order to apply uh, uh, to apply uh, uh, the, 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 the argument from 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 uh, uh, Alexander Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, and so I, I will not show you the proof. I will just uh, one sentence is what is the idea? The idea is that uh, uh, what what you do is you pick a gradient flow of, of the Dirichlet energy and you check that. I mean, up to multiply it by the reference measure m, you get a gradient flow of the entropy. So then, uh, using the uniqueness of the gradient flow of the entropy, this gives you uh, the result. Okay. Now the details are in the slides, so if you if you if you uh, will pick the slide, which I guess will be uh, available uh, 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 in some website of the conference. I mean, uh, some details are there. So so, uh, uh, but I don't want to invest too much time on 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 on, on it. Well, papers are much longer, so 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 that's uh, uh, okay. So so, let me just synthesize that uh, uh, now now we are ready to give uh, to give uh, 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 our stricter notion. Now we can say that the space is uh, R C D K infinity, uh, provided it is C D K infinity and the heat flow is linear. Uh, what is the heat flow? Well, choose your preferred viewpoint. Uh, either gradient flow the entropy or gradient flow the dish energy. Anyway, they coincide whenever it makes sense to compare them. Uh, or which is the same C D K infinity plus W one two is inverse. Okay. Now these these I mean I, I'm sort of shortcutting uh, some some uh, historical parts. So this were this was not really uh, uh, the approach the initial approach in my paper with Ambrosio uh, with Ambrosio and Savare. We were missing some regularity results which has then uh, been uh, uh, proved by Rayala. And uh, so 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 all the this definition appeared at first in a, in a subsequent paper of mine uh, where, where uh, analysis on metric measure spaces have been, uh, have been sort of uh, uh, pushed a bit forward. And, and th these are the things that I'm going to speak to you in a second. And, uh, but anyway, the point now is, and I, of course, I didn't I ever gave you the definition of CDKN. I might do this later on, might. Uh, but, but so, so for the moment, you can you can certainly think this to take n equal infinity, and, 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 and that's okay. So so now the task is the following: uh, uh, we did uh, 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 I mean quite a half job in trying to sort of restrict uh, uh, the notion from C D K infinity to R C D K infinity. Uh, now we should prove some theorem. I mean otherwise uh, it would be pretty pointless. I mean investing time into into definitions without uh, without giving this. So so what is the plan now? The plan now is. Uh, we should do some, uh, uh, I mean, we, we should develop a calculus on metric measure space, which is refined enough that it can recognize the difference between a space such that W12 is Hilbert uh, from a space such that W12 is not Hilbert. I mean, when we are in the smooth world, uh, you try to do whatever computation on a physical manifold, then you realize immediately that your physical manifold, if your physical manifold is not Riemannian, because you are very good in making computation, and you, I mean, you soon realize that. In a metric measure setting, I mean, things are a bit harder, right? So now we, we should we should try to see wh what is the difference between W12 Hilbert and W12 non Hilbert, and then employ this difference in order to prove theorems, huh? which are otherwise not true in the in the non in the physical setting. So let me open my, my second set of slides. Yeah. Okay. So analytic properties. Uh, let me, I, I, I like this quote, uh, uh, Cheng Yao 75. Most problems in differential geometry reduce to problem in differential equation for real numbers. OK? So uh, uh, while this is a sort of well-accepted uh, uh, sort of uh, idea in the smooth setting, in the non smooth one, I mean, it means that if you want to deduce geometric properties about uh, uh, non smooth spaces, you should be good in making differential calculus over there. Otherwise, there's not really any way. I mean, we can discuss at this debate about this definition. This discussion is not smooth setting. But I mean, at, for sure, if you are not good in making computations, you, you cannot hope to reproduce all of what is known in the smooth setting without, without making computations. Okay? Uh, um, and here are some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, guidelines that I will use in order to develop this differential calculus on metric measure spaces. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, which I want to spend a few minutes on. So, so the first thing is that 
uh, this differential calculus that I'm going to propose is based on the notion of Sobolev function, not on the notion of Lipschitz function. Now, this marks a difference, for instance, with, with other works in metric spaces, and in particular, for instance, for, from what also uh, Professor Solomani is telling us these days. Why do I do so? Well, basically because the notion of RCD space is based on the notion of Sobolev function. So that, that is the crucial notion which marks the difference. So I want to build a set of definition which is tailored on, on my notion of, 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 of the notion on the notion of Sobolev function rather than one on, on, on Lipschitz function. So, so that, that's one thing. Another thing is that I would like a notion, a, a sort of calculus which is intrinsic and not depending on charts. Huh? I mean, Riemannian or Fislerian manifolds are defined via charts, so it is natural when you look at, at the definition of basic objects to use charts in order to. I mean, them well defined, but metric measure spaces are not. Huh? So we should try to define an intrinsic calculus. Even because, well, for several reasons. One is that if you are not able in doing computation in smooth in metric measure spaces, then you will have hard time proving that charts exist. Huh? So the, I mean, there is a sort of uh, uh, short, uh, I mean, there is a problem here. But but also uh, uh, but also suppose that you that you uh, uh, prove the existence of charts uh, somehow, and then you use them to define your differential calculus. But one day, when you will lack smoothness, uh, you will not know if the lack of smoothness is due to your charts, which are not good enough, or to your space, which is not good enough. Huh? Uh, I mean, that, I mean if, you build, right, if you build an intrinsic calculus, that, that is something that, that you rely on. And one last thing is that, for the moment, I mean, uh, I mean this, this will, be, will be cut out in our last or, or last two lectures, but uh, for the moment, Let's forget about trying to define what are tangent and cotangent vector fields. And in particular, let's try to forget about trying to define what it is the differential and the gradient of a function. It is possible, but let's do postpone. Let's postpone this, this issue later. Let's just try to understand what is the duality relation, differential f applied to the gradient of this. If you know this, you, you are in position, you are in the position of integrating by partial, which is, which is uh, really a pretty basic uh, tool to use. So, so let's, 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 let's discuss this. So some of the functions we know, uh, uh, let me, uh, uh, so, well, I mean, this is, I mean, our next thing. So we now focus on the differential calculus on metric measure spaces. And once this will be set, that we come back and show you that the heat flow on RCD infinity spaces will be, will have, I mean, it will be better behaved with respect to general CD infinity. Uh, um, uh, uh, so, oh, and again, uh, let's do one step back. Uh, and let's see if we properly understood how things work in the smooth setting, and then we, we can start of trying to reshuffle definition in not smooth one. So we are on RD. We have a smooth function. Well, its differential is well defined. Uh, you, you don't need any other structure than, than the smooth structure to define a differential. The differential of f uh, at a point x calculated along the direction v, where v is a tangent vector, is just the limit of the incremental rate. Okay? So easy. Uh, things are more intriguing and more interesting if you wonder who is the gradient of a function. Because so you have the differential, which is cotangent guy, the gradient is a tangent guy, so so you need some duality map from cotangent space to tangent space to define the gradient. And uh, and now and now in particular, so you have some more you need some more structure. So so the gradient of a function in a differentiable world is not well defined. Huh? You need something more. Huh? You need in particular you need a norm. And uh, how do you define a gradient? Well, here is a possibility. I mean, there are several equivalent uh, possibilities. Uh, one is to observe that if you have a smooth function f, a point x, and a tangent vector w, and you compute the differential of f along the direction w, then what you obtain is bounded from above by definition of dual norm. If you want, by the norm of w times the dual norm of the differential, which is also bounded from above by, I mean, Young inequality. And now the point is that your w is the direction where f increases the most, so it is the gradient, if and only if equality holds, uh, much like uh, in, in the discussion we did yesterday about gradient theory. Uh, so, so, or if you want, you can say that v is the gradient of f provided uh, the opposite inequality holds. Uh, this is one of the several equivalent definition of gradients, and 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 uh, in part, but uh, let me emphasize a couple of things. First of all, the gradient in general is not unique. It is unique if and only if the norm you are considering is strictly convex. And even if it is unique, it's not linear. It's linear if and only if your norm comes from a scalar product. Huh? 
So here you start seeing why things uh, on Finsner spaces are sometimes so hard, because you have two smooth functions, f and g. You take the gradient of f plus g, and that is not the gradient of f plus the gradient. Huh? The, at the level of differential, that is the case, but the gradient, no. And why, why, uh, how can you see that the, that the uh, grade might be not unique? Well, pick another time the example of yesterday of R2 with the L-infinity norm, huh? and you take uh, uh, the energy, I mean, the function f of x1, x2 equal x1. Huh? So who is the gradient of this function huh? at 0? So that's a linear function. You might say, well, I increase if I go to the right. So this guy, huh, the vector 1, 0, could be, could be my gradient. And uh, fair enough, but why not 1, 1? It has the same norm as this one, because I'm taking uh, the L-infinity norm. And if I differentiate my function along this direction, I obtain the same result. So I should take it in this direction. So if this is the gradient, why should not be this one? And of course, then, I mean, all, all the vectors, uh, 1 alpha with modulus of alpha less than 1, are, are, are candidates. Huh? So, so you don't have uniqueness, unless the norm is fixed to convex. <coughs> Now, here it comes uh, an observation, uh, an interesting observation. Take two smooth functions, f and g, on your rd, and take a point x. And now, uh, 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 apply the differential of f to all possible gradients of g at x. I take the maximum that you can achieve. Well, that, that's actually equal to the info or positive epsilon of, of the expression on the right-hand side. And actually, let me remark that uh, uh, the map which takes epsilon and gives back uh, uh, one half the norm of the differential of g plus epsilon f squared at x. Huh? This map is convex. Huh? So that inf is actually a limit when epsilon goes to 0. I'm taking the right derivative in 0 of this point. Okay, uh, uh, and there's a similar and there's a similar expression for the minimum. Uh, the minimum is the slope over negative epsilon. Now, uh, why I'm pointing it th this out? Because in order to define the left hand side, uh, we need to know who are the differentials, who are the gradients, and their duality relation. But in order to define the right hand side, we only need to know who is the modulus of the differential, which we do for stable functions on metric measure spaces. So as usual, we can take a theorem and turn this into a definition. And then we can define, given two stable functions, f and g on metric measure spaces, what is the, say, this d plus f grad g and d minus f grad g, uh, which should be this maximal and minimal value of the differential of f applied to possible gradients of g, as that inf uh, over positive epsilon of the corresponding quantity, or, or slope over negative epsilon. That's the definition. So I want to convince you that this is a good definition for, for, I mean, for the first order calculus on metric measure spaces. So what do I have to do? Uh, a couple of things. Well, first of all, let me check. Let me observe that, well, the notation makes a little bit of sense. So this d minus is less derivative than this d plus, because the left derivative of a convex function is always less derivative than a right derivative, huh? almost everywhere. Okay. We have a sort of Cauchy's bars inequality huh? that that's a trivial consequence uh, uh, of the inequality that the minimum weak upper gradient of g plus epsilon f is less or equal than minimum weak upper gradient of g plus modulus of epsilon weak upper gradient of f. Uh, so you plug this inequality over there and you're done. And uh, well, there is some, some I mean, tricky business going on with, with sign. If you, if, you, if you swap signs here and there, uh, uh, they affect, uh, they affect the, 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 this d plus and the minus f. OK, now, now what are the basic calculus rules? Well, first of all, uh, this object is uh, local, at least as local as, as minimal weak upper gradients were, huh? because, because it, is only, it is defined only in terms of minimal weak upper gradients. So if f and g coincide with f tilde and g tilde on some Borel set, then, then also, also this duality and non-sum uh, are there. We have chain rules both at the level of differentials and at the level of gradients. There is, also, there is only some, uh, I mean, annoying thing to, 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 to be uh, taken into account by, by, I mean, by these plus and minus which are going on there. But I mean, beside that, they really look like uh, normal chain rules. And we also have the Leibniz rule. Well, in a quite ugly way, but let me say this. So we have, we have, a so we have the best possible Leibniz rule 
available, I mean, for this uh, d plus and minus, which is at the level of differential. So, so I'm not stating uh, a Leibniz rule at the level of gradient, uh, uh, because that is false in general. Huh? So on a Fisler manifold, the gradient of uh, f times g is not f grad g plus g grad f. Huh? That it is true if and only if the gradient linearly depends on the function, so if and only if your Fisler is actually reminded. So that's another point where you see calculus behaving differently. Huh? Now, beside that and beside, uh, I mean, taking into account some, 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 uh, uh, I mean, some sign issue, we have a Leibniz rule uh, uh, for different. Okay, so, so uh, well, let me, let me now, I mean, uh, sort of uh, uh, isolate the definition of, say, infinitesimal Hilbertian space as those spaces where W12 is Hilbert. And let me point out that in this case, uh, uh, for every so couple of Sobolev functions, uh, uh, d plus is equal to d minus, so we don't have this uh, sort of flexibility in the definition, and also we can swap f and g. Uh, now, you can take these identities as uh, 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 an abstract version of risk theorem. Uh, so, so on, on, uh, on a, um, a Riemannian setting, we can swap differentials and gradients as we wish, thanks to the scalar product. And that's more or less the same thing that we can do on, 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 on spaces with such that W12 is in there. Okay? It's required, I mean, it's not entirely obvious, this definition, but I mean, that's true. So are we satisfied? So we have, uh, so we do have some basic tools for, for making a, a, a first order calculus. Uh, so we define this differential of f applied to the gradient of g. Except that, uh, uh, so this definition, uh, it appears like, I mean, there is a certain amount of cheating, right? I mean, the differential of f applied to a certain tangent vector should be the derivative of f in, in that direction. Uh, that, that, that is what really the, the, the essence of the differential is. And this concept uh, has not appeared, at least so far, in, 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 in my definition. What I, what I, I took this, this derivative of, uh, I mean, of the minimum weak upper gradient squared, I mean, of, the, of this object. But this doesn't really describe what it is the, the derivative of f in the direction of grad g. Huh? So let's, let's think one moment to that, to, to that issue. Uh, and let me observe the following fact. If we take a Sobolev function g and a test plan phi, if you play a little bit uh, with the definition of Sobolev function, what you can achieve uh, is the above inequality. So if you differ so Look at the left hand side. The left hand side is, morally speaking, is uh, the derivative of g in the direction of pi, uh, in some sense. The max, so I take the link soup. Uh, I wish the limit, uh, I knew what the limit existed. I don't know. So I take the link soup. And this link soup is bounded from above by one half the uh, sort of, in a sense, L2 norm with respect to an appropriate measure of the minimum weak up and of g plus the kinetic energy at time zero uh, of pi. So that, so this inequality is really the analogous of the inequality that we have seen before. So let me write what that inequality would be in this smooth setting. In this smooth setting would be this. It would be something like the differential of G, uh, uh, see, in the point gamma zero calculated along the direction gamma zero prime. This is less or equal than one half the differential of G squared in gamma zero plus one half gamma zero prime squared. Huh? So, so so that's a way of writing this inequality in the non-smooth setting, okay? Now, we have seen uh, that, uh, that in the smooth setting, in the Fisher world, asking uh, for the other inequality was asking for gamma prime zero to be the gradient of g. That was sort of by definition. So we can do the same in here and say, look, uh, uh, I say that pi, the pi is the gradient of g, or say represent the gradient of g, provided the other inequality is true. Okay? In the smooth setting, if I were on a Finsler world, this would be true if and only if gamma zero prime is equal to minus gradient of, uh, is equal to gradient of g almost everywhere. Pi almost everywhere. So, so, and notice that this imitates quite a lot the definition of gradient flow that we've seen, uh, uh, gradient flow for functions in matrix space. Yeah? It's just a, 
a gradient flow in a sense of a Sobolev function at time zero. Huh? So I want phi to, I mean, to decrease, to in, sorry, in this case, to, uh, to increase g as fast as possible. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I could, so if everything is smooth, I would do the following. If everything is very smooth, I would take, uh, so first of all, there is, there is, yeah, yeah, it's Riemannian and G is infinity with compass support. Let me remark, let me underline that there is one degree of freedom uh, in uh, defining pi, so there is, a, there is a little bit of freedom on who is uh, E0 push forward pi. Uh, with your starting measure. You have a starting measure, and then from there you, you move uh, in the direction of pi. Now, 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 how do, so suppose that this, this is given. So, so give me a measure mu, whatever, and I will produce a pi test plan such that, such that uh, I mean, uh, which represents the gradient of g. What do I do? Well, consider the map uh, from x, uh, from your Riemannian manifold, smooth Riemannian manifold, to c, 0, 1, x, which takes a point and gives back the curve, uh, which is, uh, I don't know how to call it, let me call it t of x. This is uh, 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 a curve which at time t is x plus t times grad g of x. So from x, uh, I move in the direction uh, 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 grad g of x. Uh, that's what I do. Okay? And I think this is a map which takes point and gives back curves. I move straight on. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry, this was in Rn, so, so, yeah, sorry, this was in Rn. In Riemannian manifold, I should write x, x, yeah. sorry, sorry, sure, x, absolutely, yeah, that's way better, yeah, x, yeah? Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> and now, now, who is pi? I mean, a choice of pi, pi is certainly not unique, I mean, I, I don't have a unique way of, of going in a certain direction. Uh, 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 so pi, I can pick pi as t push forward. Now, actually, I want pi, so I want pi to be, to be a test plan. So one of the conditions this, uh, on this test plan is that curves do not overlap too much, right? I mean, I, don't I, I would like my time marginals of this to be bounded by some constant times my volume measure. Now, as far as my function g is smooth enough uh, I, and t is sufficiently small, I do not really run in this issue. No? But if uh, I see that my measure is concentrating uh, after some time. Uh, well, I do essentially whatever I want because anyway, anyway, my my definition of representing the is something which takes into account only what happens when t is close to zero. Uh, so for t close to zero, this will never give give an issue. Uh, for t bigger than zero, who cares? Because I, I don't, I, don't really, uh, I stop. Uh, I don't move anymore. And now. Uh, uh, the, there are two interesting things about, about uh, plans representing grids. The first is that they exist uh, on arbitrary metric measure space. So, so, so uh, you take a subordinate function. You take whatever initial measure mu, which is bounded from above by some constant times m. Uh, then I can find, uh, I can find uh, a, a plan uh, representing the gradient of g with that as initial measure. Okay, so it's a sort of a solution of a first order uh, sort of uh, uh, problem just at time zero, okay? Now, this theorem has been stated and, and proved uh, by, 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 me, by myself, but in fact, the proof has a lot to do with the proof that I didn't show you about uh, identification of gradient flow of the relative entropy and of, uh, and of uh, Dirichlet energy. So in fact, the tools that are needed to prove this result were already present in the uh, paper with Kowal and Dota and also the one with Ambrose and Kowal, okay? So you can go in the direction of, of gradient, in a sense. And now, if you can do that, now, now a natural question occurs, so, which is the following. Take two Sobolev functions and take pi, which represents the gradient of g. And now, now pi goes in the direction of grad g, and I differentiate f in the direction of pi. OK? So, 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 imagine, so, so imagine gamma prime 0 equal grad g, uh, in some sense. And now consider this limit. Uh, so differentiate f in that direction. Now I hope that this is related to this d plus f grad g and d minus f grad g, because if not, we are in trouble. Right? I mean, that is really what the differential of f applies to grad g should be. 
and, and, and actually does in a quite uh, a trivial way. So these things are, I mean, this is bounded from above by the interval d plus f and bounded from below by the interval sigma d plus f. Okay? The proof of this fact is one line. I mean, it's really trivial. And there, there is nothing there. Uh, 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 but it is important that to know that, the, that this holds. In particular, in particular, uh, 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 if you are on, on any space such that d minus is equal to d plus of f g, for instance, uh, infinitesimal Hilbertian spaces, then uh, this limit exists. Because the limb soup and the limb inf I mean, are bounded from above from below by, by the same quantity. So in this setting, uh, we could really think plants representing gradients as uh, differentiation operators. Uh, we can differentiate Sobole functions along the direction of, of such test plants. Okay? So and this sort of completes the first order calculus uh, tools that I wanted to, to present to you. Yeah. No, no, wait, no, uh, no, there are several reasons. No, 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 uniqueness you cannot expect. But because even in the smooth setting, uh, uh, if I give you a vector field, uh, so this is the gradient of G. Now, the requirement that I make on this test plan is that at time zero, the derivative is this one. But at later time, can do whatever they want. So I could pick cars which do like this, cars which do like that, cars which do like that, cars which do like that, and then they stop after time one half and whatever. There is a high amount of non-uniqueness. So, so what is unique in some sense is just the derivative at time zero. So if I take a curve and I tell you who is its derivative at time zero and where this curve starts, can I hope that this curve is unique? Well, no, because, and, and that's uh, morally the same thing which is happening here. So imagine such a pi as a collection of curves with the property that in some sense, uh, which is specified at time zero, they have a prescribed derivative, okay? But that's a natural question. But uh, in a sense, the answer is no for, for uh, I mean, there's quite a lot of proof. OK? Oh, I call these horizontal and vertical derivatives because, uh, I mean, uh, this derivative is very much horizontal, right? I mean, I, I, I perturb the independent variable. So if I, if I draw the, the, the graph of f and g in the Cartesian plane, x, y axis, I'm perturbing on the x. So I'm perturbing the horizontal world. While these guys were defined by considering a, a g plus epsilon f, which is a perturbation on the vertical world. Huh? And, and moreover, this kind of thing is, is something which occurs you very often when you work with the vast assigned geometry, and you work with displacement interpolation. I mean, this 1D localization is something which occurs, in a sense, along geodesics. While this, the kind of perturbation which is behind this definition is something which occurs very often when you work in L2. Mm, when, you, when you interpolate in L2, you interpolate vertically. Huh? So, so this is another, uh, 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 another uh, uh, point of view on the fact that differential calculus based on classical L2 and differential calculus based on vast assigned geometry, they are related. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Let's discuss. Uh, so I'm also confused. So uh, am I over? Yeah. No. Five minutes. Okay, okay. Th that's just to be sure. So, so, so let me discuss uh, a couple of things about. So, at least to to introduce the discussion, we'll continue, uh, uh, I guess, tomorrow on on the heat flow on RCD spaces. Uh, uh, um, let me present uh, a different notion uh, of a gradient flow in a metric setting, with respect to the one that I gave you yesterday. Uh, and of course, as usual, in order to introduce a different notion, I, I show you how things work in a smooth setting uh, to, to 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 propose a definition. So, so uh, take a k-convex function over R d, and and, uh, and 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 consider a gradient flow. So uh, x t a gradient flow trajectory. So a, a curve such that uh, its derivative minus the gradient of e at x. Now pick uh, 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 your preferred point y on R d and consider the derivative of uh, of the square distance of one of the square distance. Now, this derivative, uh, of course, is equal to x prime uh, uh, dot x t minus y, which I can also rewrite as grad x, grad o e at x t times y minus x t. I mean, I'm, I'm doing nothing exceptional. But also, 
for t fixed, consider the geodesic or the segment which connects x t to y, which is this one, and differentiate your energy functional uh, in that direction, and you obtain the same result. Oh, that's interesting because now, now I can r rewrite the things by saying that look, this derivative is the same as this one. And now this derivative, uh, I mean, if the function is convex, uh, the derivative is bounded by e of y minus e of xt. If it is k convex, then if the action is bounded from below by k, you have a, a perturbation term, which, which, which is this one. Okay. Now, why do I present this one? Well, because this the validity of this inequality for every t and every y, in fact, characterizes the solution uh, of the gradient flow equation. Uh, that's, that's not hard to check. That if you know this for every y and every t, then you can go back to the, the chain of inequality. And, and this one is something which, again, does not require any differential uh, structure. If I replace x t minus y squared by distance squared uh, between x t and y, I can trace it on metric space. So let me, let me give a definition. So I say that uh, 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 I, have a so I have a metric space, I have a functional, and I have k, which is a real number. Uh, I, and, uh, and I say that a, a curve is a gradient flow in the EVI k sense. EVI stands for evolutional variational inequality. Huh? And k is our parameter. Uh, if, uh, uh, your, if the curve is absolutely continuous, at least locally, and for every y, we have the same inequality that we wrote before uh, 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 true for almost every k. That's, that's, that's a, a, a different notion of, uh, I mean, a different characterization of gradient flows. And of course, the first question is whether, whether uh, what is the relation between this notion and the one I presented yesterday, and there's a strict link. I mean, there is, a, there is an implication. So Savare proved that if you have a, a gradient flow in this EVI sense, then it is also a gradient flow in the sense that we have seen yesterday. Hmm? So this is a stricter notion. The vice versa is not true. Okay? It should be emphasized. So this notion of gradient flow, the one that we have seen yesterday, is what grants uh, existence under some uh, uh, convexity and lower semi-continuity uh, uh, assumption. Uh, while this EVIK notion is the one which is grants uh, uniqueness. Huh? But EVIK, we are not sure that it exists. So morally speaking, you can expect uh, EVIK uh, uh, gradient flows to exist uh, if and only if your function is k-convex and your metric space looks uh, Riemannian rather than physical. Because in deriving the definition of, uh, of uh, uh, the VIK notion, we differentiated the distance squared. And this has good properties only if your distance comes from, comes from a scalar code in some sense. <coughs> rather than, rather than. So, so tomorrow, or nec the next lesson, whenever it will be, uh, uh, I will show you that uh, 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 on RCD, so First fact, uh, uh, on CDK infinity spaces, we do not have uh, that the, uh, uh, we do not have EVI k gradient flow of the entropy in the vast end space, and, but this we have in our CDK infinity spaces. So, so we see this and some consequences of, uh, consequences of, of, of this in the next lesson. So thank you for the moment, and thank you.